talk to everybody and keep track of them and then follow up on them. That's the best way to do it. One of our investors in the first group was an individual. We started talking about markets and he came in and is one of the investors on our properties. You talk to people, you keep those connections with them and they can be part of your investor pool. Welcome to Multifamily Deal Lab, where your host, Dave Lindahl, dissects recent multifamily deals done by his guests. Dave will extract what went right, what went wrong, and a number of key takeaways so your next deal may be more profitable. Welcome everybody to Multifamily Deal Lab. This is the podcast where we dissect deals. So today I have Sherry and Laird with me. And Sherry and Laird, tell everybody who you are and where you're from. Okay. So, we're... Go ahead, Sherry, Laird. Go ahead. <laughs> are, you guys, are, you guys, are you guys married? Yes. Yes, we are. Okay. So what's going on here? We got people trying to talk over each other. Have you guys been to counseling? 41 years we've been married. <laughs> 41 years. Wow. Yeah. That's good. All right. So go ahead. Ladies first. We live in Cave Creek, Arizona. Oh. We have two kids, grown, and four grandchildren. We have been with Ari Mentor since February of 2018 when we did a initial seminar. Then we did the three-day boot camp not long thereafter. We've been to the 2019 Ari Mentor UP and then went to the UP in Dallas and Phoenix, which is our local area. UP is Ultimate Partnering. For those of you that aren't familiar, this year Ultimate Partnering is in San Diego and it's September 2023. Go to ultimatepartnering.com if you want to find out more. All right. You guys got into this deal. Describe the deal that we're going to talk about today. Yeah. The deal is two properties that total 232 units. They're located in Vicksburg, Mississippi. The final price on it was a little over $11 million. And it was a property that is in an area that we know well. That's where our first property was located that we call Cannon Gate. We know the market drivers and everything is uh, good about the area. So you just talked about market drivers. Why did you decide to go into Pittsburgh? Is that right? Vicksburg. <laughs> Vicksburg is a multifaceted area. It's a tertiary market. It's about 40 minutes away from Jackson, which is the large metropolitan area closest to it. But there's oil, there's lumber, there's manufacturing, there's transportation, and there's EDRC, which is component of the... Army Corps of Engineers. The Army Corps of Engineers, yeah. It was going to come to me. So in general, there's a lot of different market drivers. So the economic basis spread out over a large area. And another reason that we like the area is that over 7,000 people commute into Vicksburg on a daily basis to work. And so that means there's not enough housing that is there, whether it be single family or multifamily. And so it gives us an opportunity to go in, take a property, and then raise the value of it so that we can have higher rents. And we can pick up some of those 7,000 that are coming in every day. Awesome. So uh, Sherry, how'd you find this deal? We operate Cannon Gate and the broker was working with the seller and the seller had a large portfolio in Louisiana and in Mississippi. The broker advised him to divide his portfolio into Louisiana and Mississippi. And he told the seller that he would shop the area to see if there were any owners that might be interested in purchasing the Mississippi portion. He shopped our Cannon Gate property, uh, looked at how we were operating it, gave Cindy in our group a call and told her that he was the owner of some properties and would like to know how we were getting higher rents. She decided to go ahead and share with him. And ultimately, he came back to us and asked us if we would like to buy these properties. They weren't on the market. They were pocket listing. And we decided to go forward with them because the price that the seller wanted was within the wheelhouse of our underwriting. Are these two properties, 200 plus units, are they contiguous? Are they next to each other? No, they're a couple miles away from each other. They're within 15 minutes of each other. Did you take them both under the same deed? We did separate financing, separate deed each. Okay. But good. we packaged them together for syndication. All right. So two separate deeds allows you to sell them individually when you want to. Yes. That's good. All right. So it was on for, was it 11 million? Was that the initial asking price? Well, initially there were three properties. We purchased all three for 12.45 million. Then we separated the third one out, which is only 27 units. And we joint ventured that one. The two remaining were 100 units and 132 units. We syndicated those two properties. And that's what we're talking about today. 
So you eliminated the third one? We didn't offices? eliminate it. We did take it down, but we took it down under a joint venture. All right. So these two that you bought, was there a straightforward asking price for these two only? No. I separate when I gave you the sales price, I separated out the other one. We ended up with these two at eleven million once we separated right. out the third property. Was there a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar reduction in the amount that they were asking for the original? Yes. Yes. Oh, Originally okay, he wanted thirteen million for all three. And then we negotiated with him and got to twelve point seven five. And then when we did our due diligence on the properties, we found a lot of things that were out of order, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we negotiated a reduction. We retraded $450,000. Okay. So, Lair, there was a number of things that were wrong at your fiscal due diligence. Was there any problems with the financial due diligence? Was that off at all? The financial due diligence wasn't, you know, that we were pretty tight on that. Okay. So then let's go back. So you've got physical due diligence. You've got a list of things that are wrong with the property that's going to cost you money. And number one, how did you present that to the seller, your reduction? And number two, while you're doing that, was there more than $450,000 worth of work on your list? So if you could answer those two questions, you would like to go ahead. Actually, there was more. There was over 900000 on the list of things to do. Just the two properties or all three? For just the two properties. Well, I guess part of that was all three. Yeah. The two properties, the basic thing that we looked at is that there were some things that were cosmetic, things that probably normally should have been taken care of, but just didn't get done. That's paint and, and some stuff like that. But the things that really worried us were there were some major erosion issues that were there. There were some overhanging trees over the property. So why does that concern you, overhanging trees on the buildings? Part of it is because it could fall. And so it becomes one of those things that when you're dealing with the lender, they're going to come in and they're going to look at the property. They're going to look at potential risks of the property. And they're going to give you a list of things that you have to take care of immediately or within a very short period of time. And these particular things that we were looking at were basically something that if his lender would have come in and looked at the property, they would have said, you have to fix these right now. And they would have given him that mandate. So we felt pretty comfortable when we went forward and we said, we're not asking for the cosmetic things. We're asking for the things that can physically hurt the property or cause injury to an individual. Let's go back yep. to the roof for a second. So yes, the trees could fall over and damage the property. Number one, yep. number two, the stuff from the trees get trapped underneath the shingles or worse, it goes down and it goes into the gutters as the gutters get clogged. Mm -hmm. The water builds up, goes underneath the sheathing of the roof and then it deteriorates the sheathing and now you have a big roof problem. So when you say the trees are too close, these are the things we're looking at when the trees are too close. Plus root invasion into the foundation too. Mm -hmm. So things like that. So what were a couple other things, Sherry? The biggest property, the 132 door property has two pools. They have a large pool, which is a normal size pool for adults and everything. And then they have a children's play pool. And the children's play pool had been stagnant and sitting there not working for two years. Any water in and it? It had old, green, moldy, nasty water. You in could it. call it water. <laughs> if somebody was... Yeah, there could have been something dead in there. We wouldn't have seen it. That and then the pump house was leaning about 10 degrees because of the erosion that was happening. And the plumbing was wonky and we didn't know how much work we were going to have to do the pool. We had estimates of about $25,000 to repair the pool. So we asked the seller for that in part of our retrade. We also had major erosion that was next to the pool and next to building that had the clubhouse and the rental office and the laundry. Uh, matter of fact, the sidewalk was more of a bridge than it was a sidewalk because there was undercutting in erosion around and through that area. What was so causing we, that? There was some drainage issues off the roof that they hadn't sealed between the sidewalk and the boundary of the building. And so the water was beating down and going underneath the sidewalk. And then with heavy rains, it was eroding the dirt and uh, pack underneath that sidewalk so that there was a probably about a foot to a foot and a half gap under the sidewalk and down the side of the ravine. And it was creating a little ravine into a creek. So we knew there would be problems with that, that we would have to take into consideration that we would have to fill that, put metal, put concrete, put rock down and build it up and then pour new concrete for the sidewalk and the surround for the pool. All right. So you've got a list of things. Was there anything else that was like out of the ordinary? 
there were some shingles missing, a little roofing things, a little flashing on the roof. Not major, but then there were some sidewalks that were kind of wonky that would need to be ground or re-poured. Was that from the roots of other trees? or Actually, I think it was just from settling and age. These are 1970 products, and I don't think they'd ever done any restructuring of any of the sidewalks and that kind Mm -hmm. of thing. So trip hazards, those kinds of things. All in all, the buildings were solid. They're brick. So the buildings were fine. They're built in the 1970s. Do they have air conditioning on the window units? Yes, they have the separated units with the air handler in the apartment itself and then the uh, condenser on the outside. On a concrete. On a pad, yeah. Okay, good. Sometimes that age has them right in the window. The window boxes. Yeah. The current. Yep. <laughs> I was going to ask you how you remedied that situation or were planning to. All right, so Laird, so yeah. you have this list of items. Uh, you need to go back and retrade the seller. What's your strategy? What's your tactic? How do you do it? So we started off by going back with the full amount, and that was kind of the approach that I came up with. And then we talked about taking out the things that were the cosmetic things, and he still pushed back quite a bit. And Sherry got the idea of putting together a letter that was very straightforward and basically said, listen, if your lender comes in and sees this, he's going to make you repair it. We can give you some options. You can either give us a a credit at the end of the sale for a given amount, or you can go and find a local repair people and you can have it repaired before the sale closes. And we gave them several different options with that. And he opted that better for him was to just give us a discount at the end of the $450,000. So he gave him some options. Excellent. I spent my career in business as an escrow officer, so I've seen a lot of retrades. So I wrote him a pretty good letter that basically the points and told him we would work with him on the options and that he could do these things or he could give us the credit. That was the origination of that. And I'll bet that had matter of fact mother's touch to it. Yes, it did. This is the way it is. (laughs) Excellent. So this is a $11 million deal. You must have had to raise uh, close to $3 million or just over $3 million for this? We actually raised 6.3 because we're putting for the two deals for the deals. Yes. For the wow. two deals, we raised a little over 2 million for renovations of the units. We're going to do 75% of the units. Plus we're doing an exterior redo. We've repainted, we have pressure washed the buildings. We've done all the concrete work that needed for the sidewalks. We're going to be doing a new landscaping plan. We're bringing these up from a C to a B property, basically. And the property's in a B area? It is. So part of your analysis when going into this deal was the fact that now you got a C asset in a B area, which means you can do a repositioning. And then you've got to determine how much you're going to put in per unit, which how much did you do per unit? When we analyzed the units, the yeah. unit, um, the inside per unit ended up between sixty-seven and $6,900 per unit. We're not doing a full remodel. We're doing paint. We're doing new flooring. We're not replacing, but redoing the countertops. We're putting in new lighting fixtures. We're putting in new plumbing fixtures like faucets and new blinds and ceiling fans. And new appliances. And new appliances. appliances, All new stainless steel appliances. Did you say you were refacing the cabinets or you were just going to leave them as is? Well, the cabinets, for the most part, are in really good shape. They're solid wood. They're not laminate. So we've been basically painting them if they needed paint or leaving them alone if they were in good shape. Okay, excellent. And similarly with the bathrooms. So you, whatever you're doing yeah. in the kitchens, you're basically doing in the bathrooms as well. Yes. So you just said you were going to redo the countertops and not replace them. Me being from Boston... When I first went down to San Antonio, my first market, and I saw that this is way back in the early 2000s, when I saw that they had painted the countertops, I was with my partner and we were just laughing. I was like, they painted the countertops. Can you believe that? Little did I know after we started looking at more and more properties is that that's what they do. They use a special paint, but they repaint the countertops. Since that time, the way that they redo countertops has been like the vastly improved that you can't even tell. Can you explain that to everybody exactly what they do when they redo a countertop? So what they're doing with this is it's in, I don't know if it's one part or a two part epoxy that is put on it, but it creates a really hard finish on top. And they have a pattern that they put into it that looks like a speckled granite. So it's actually, it has gray, black, and white. So it's it's a very nice product. It matches well with the color scheme that we have for the rest of the walls and also the flooring that we're putting in. So it makes it a really nice, unique look, very modern looking. Once it cures, it's very hard. It's got a nice high gloss sheen and it's a nice countertop. It's a great quality product and finish the way they're doing it. It just gets better and better every year. It's it's just unbelievable. Yep. Saves a lot of money too. 
Yes. Okay, so you had a $6 million raise. This leads to a couple of questions. The first question, to the investors, what was your cash on cash return first year if you're redoing 75% of the units and uh, $2 million in rehab? We're looking at beginning, of course, first year with all the things that we're going to do, we we're at 6%, but then that year five, we projected out around 14%. And you're going to hit the, was it a 6% pref or was it like, we're so going to do 6%? It's a 7% percent pref. It's a 7% pref. And yeah. then we'll talk about that today or a little bit. We have both A1 and an A2 investor. We had several people that wanted to come in with a higher dollar value. So we created an A1 that had a 10% preferred with a 10% cap at the end. So 20% annualized. Let me just clarify that. So it's a 10% pref per year and then another 10 on the exit? Yes. Yeah, it's a 10% cap on the exit. So it's annualized at 20? Yes. Wow, that's a pretty good deal. The reason I say that is because I've seen a lot of deals where somebody that's willing to put in like a half a million or a million or somebody that just doesn't want to participate in equity will get the higher prep at 10, but they won't get anything on the back end. A 10 and 10 is like good. The numbers work. Yeah. So what was the A2? The A2 is a 7%. Yeah, 7% return and then variable on the back end. And what was your forecast for the back end for the 22.5? Were they annualized out of 22.5? Might be good too. Good. Okay. So, how long have you owned this deal? We closed it on December 28th, 2022. So, you're five months on. So, how's it going? It's going well. We've been able to renovate a number of units. We raised our rents by $150 on renewals, and the renovated units are getting $300 more out the door. Okay. So that was like part two of my question on your renovation. So first of all, you have to determine how much, how you're going to renovate and the amount to the extent that you're going to renovate. So you take an inventory of your competition, you figure out what they got, and then you try to do just a little bit better. Number one. Then number two, how did you know what rent you were going to be able to get and know that this deal was actually going to pencil out? in the end with these renovations? Well, we've done several studies. We had our property management company do the studies and they did them for us gratis. They did CoStar, they did ALN market study. We also are in the market and our current property that we had already owned, Canongate, was we've been raising rent steadily for two years and Mm -hmm. we were close to market at that point. So we knew going in that if we could create a B property, what our market would be. And it's happening. Yes, it's happening. All right. Well, that's excellent. Okay. So where did the money come from? Where did you raise the $6 million? That's a pretty good size raise. Well, we had Vanessa Alfaro as one of our sponsors, and we had Eric Stewart as the other of our sponsors. Excellent. And Vanessa has a good pool of investors. We have some investors, Laird and I, and then Cindy and Lynn, our partners, have some investors. We also brought in a couple of other GPs that had investors. So we pooled all of our resources and we did a 506B. So you had a strategy of getting sponsors that would also bring in investors. You had a strategy of bringing other general partners in that had an investor pool as well. And then you had your own investors. So what I want to ask you is, where did you get your investors? That's what everybody wants to know. How do you get these investors? Relationships, relationships, relationships. And where do those relationships start? Where and how? Family, friends. How do you bring that up to a family member or a friend about you investing in multifamily properties? When is the best opportunity that you found? So I'll talk to you about a new friend that we've got. Yeah. When Sherry and I were coming back from a investor's day that we had back in Vicksburg on Saturday night, We were walking through the airport and there was a lady behind. We just started up a conversation and she said, well, she asked because we came in on the same flight and she had come in from Memphis and it was a really bad day for her. And she asked us where we came from. And we said, we came from Vicksburg. We were at Investors there. And she said, Investors Day. So we started to explain to her about multifamily and what we did. And she said, I'm a realtor. And she said, I'm interested in multifamily. And so we exchanged business cards at that point. And we've now exchanged some emails with her and we're going to get her invited to some of the local media groups that we have here and the possibility that she's going to come in and be a potential investor in the future. Talk to everybody and keep track of them and then follow up on them. That's the best way to do it. One of our investors in the first group was an individual that I met years ago when I was looking for a new job. And I have to meet this individual. We started talking. We arranged to have a couple lunches so that we could compare notes about what was happening with the markets and that. And he came in as one of the investors on our properties. You talk to people, you keep those connections with them, and they can be part of your investor pool. Just throw a seed out there. 
Yeah, a seed with intent, but it's not the intent of finding people to put money in your deals. There is the intent of being in the right place at the right time, but it's not, I got to go out there and I got to raise some money type of a thing. It's when the opportunity strikes. No, it starts early. To let everybody know what you're doing. One of the investors in this deal came back after our raise had closed and said, I want to invest more money. And I have a friend who wants to invest some money. And so it's just relationships and creating the environment where they can come to you and ask you for these things, letting them know that you're open to talk about anything and everything in your deals and what investing is like and what they should expect. Keep track of your investors. What contact management system are you using, if any? We have a great MailChimp system. It's cheap. It's free. It's easy. We also have our InvestNext portal that we use for communications. We put out a monthly newsletter letting people know, everybody that's investing, know what's happening on the property, how many vacancies we have, what the ongoing renovations look like, if there are any happenings on the property like Easter, egg hunts, those kinds of things, giving them pictures of those things so that they have a feeling that they're involved in the property and that they know what's happening. Do you do a newsletter for every property that you own? Yes. Do you use a newsletter template agency? Nope. I write the newsletter for Canongate. We have other LPs that wanted to be involved in asset management that are writing the letters for the other properties. So we have letters that go out on each and every one of our properties. By the way, that just reminded me to promote my own website, Passive Investing, which is PassiveForNow.com. If you're wondering or interested in what we're doing for deals, go to PassiveForNow.com. You can take a look. It's not a commitment to give us any money. Just a look. So go there if you want to. All right. So let me see. What didn't we cover in this deal that was like, wow, we got to tell you the story type of a thing? Anything? Mm. I had an investor tour this last weekend. Actually, it was Friday of last week. And so these are the existing investors. Yep. Right. What we've done is we invite them all down. We hire a bus. We have breakfast provided at one of the properties. We tour all the properties. We tour a renovated unit and a classic unit at each of the properties. We walk the properties and talk about the repairs that we've done so far and what's going ongoing. We go to lunch at a fabulous restaurant in Vicksburg. And then in the afternoon, we tour the economic drivers in Vicksburg. We drive by the sites that where things are happening. There happens to be a building there called My City, which is a center for technology. The Army Corps of Engineers has a whole floor there that they operate out of. And they provide technology that can be patented and sold to outside sources. And so we go to places like that. We go to the visitor center for the Mississippi Visitor Center, which is a great photo op site. We went to Canongate. We saw areas where the different colleges are in my city are have installations. So of we do all of your investors, the number of investors, what percentage do you think showed up? Well, we have about, let me see, we have a total of 57 investors and 21 showed up. Wow. That's a good turnout. Yeah. They must have loved it. It was fabulous. I'm sure they're going to be referring other people to you guys. That's a very, very smart thing to do. Congratulations. All right. So I got a couple of questions. Ending of the podcast questions. Number one, whose Peloton is that back there? His. Oh, the Peloton? (laughs) Yeah, that's mine. your bike. It's in my office. And so I typically get up between 4 and 4.30 in the morning. And a couple days a week, I try and get on the Peloton and do at least 45 minutes. Who's your favorite instructor? Dennis Morton. Oh, yeah. I like Dennis, too. I like that girl that has the bandana and plays rock and roll. I don't know. There's yeah. the one. Is it uh, Lisa Lovewell? Oh, I like her, too. She rides more like I ride, but she kicks my butt every time I get on the bike oh, with her. So it's like it's a love-hate relationship. That's awesome. Between the two of you, what is the your favorite inspirational book that you've read or are currently reading? There was actually a, a book that I picked up about a year ago. It's called How Leadership Actually Works. And the reason that I kind of like this is that the individual's name who wrote it is Larry Yatch, Y-A-T-C-H. And he is a Navy SEAL. And he talked about how the Navy SEALs uh, deal with leadership issues and the redundancy that is in it. And so he has some real life experiences that he uses. And we heard him talk and he's an inspirational individual. And, and he really lets you know the caliber of individual that is in our armed forces. All of those books written by those Navy SEALs are all great. I've read just about every one of them. I haven't heard about that one though. Yeah, he was amazing. How about you, Carrie? Uh, mine is Mindset, the New Psychology of Success. Okay. It's by Carol S. Dweck. 
and it's how we can learn to fulfill our potential. Next on my reading list. Yes. Oh, great. All right, good. Well, congratulations on your deal. I'm sure there's going to be another one that's going to pop up in Fitchburg. And uh, that is the uh, way that they did their deal. We just dissected it on Multi Family Deal Lab, and we'll see you again next time. Bye, everybody. All right, good job. Very good. Nice deal, too. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. Yeah, now we're going to open up for questions. You guys ready? We're going to do live Q&A. So, Jermaine, who's first? All right, so we got Shirley first. She actually wrote in two questions. The first one is, did you rebrand to attract higher level renters? No. Yes and no, I guess well. you'd say. <laughs> we did. We have the properties in question. They were doing all of their bookkeeping by hand. So they had ledgers. Our property management company that we used again, because we used the same property management company that we had on our initial, has trained, retrained our personnel to seek for higher net worth individuals, a better level of renter. We've also started apartments.com. We're looking into the Chamber of Commerce and joining that, at least one of our properties. And we've advertised or put out Facebook pages, Google pages. And so we are pushing for a little higher. So we're marketing more with it, but we haven't changed yeah. the name of the properties and we haven't done anything like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. So there's the no to it and my yes. <laughs> Basically, you're taking a C property and bringing it up to a B or B minus. So you really are changing the status of the inside of the property coincides with the Bs. I'm like in this brain fog because there's a stomach bug going around here in the Northeast and my kids have had it the last three nights. And so all three nights I've been waking up and my son walked into my room on Sunday night and said, dad, I feel sick. <laughs> <laughs> Sherry and yeah, I had well, it earlier this week. Oh, you had it yeah. earlier this week? Yeah, yeah. It must be going yeah. around the country. Yeah, it is. That was another job that I picked up from school today. It kind of goes like... A in waves. Sitting it every two days. Yeah. <laughs> so what I was trying to say was you get a C property, you're going to raise it up to a B minus. So you're upgrading the interiors of the unit. So, so it's attractive to those B minus type of tenants. So you can raise the rent. So you really are changing the tenant profile. Right. Yes. And the square That's footage, right. because of the date that they were built, the square footage is a lot larger than the ones they're building today. Yeah, that's nice. You know, it's getting smaller and smaller. Okay, next question. All right, this one's from Irma. She wants to know what's the current occupancy rate on the apartment. Current occupancy rate with the once we have raised the renewal to up by 150, the current occupancy rate is about 90 percent. It was 98 percent, but we are going through a transition where we're renovating units. We need units to renovate. We're doing six to ten a month. And when we bumped up the $150, there was a collective gasp and we started losing tenants. But that was a good thing because we had projected our vacancy at 9 to 10% from the get-go so that we could renovate those units. We're going to be renovating about 75% of the units total. So part of the plan. Yep. Next question. This one's from Carol. She writes, are you updating as people move or why are they in your place? As people move out, we're renovating the vacant units and getting them ready for new tenants at a $300 premium yeah. above what we were getting. It's almost impossible to renovate a unit while a tenant is still living there. Yeah. So what you basically do is move them. I mean, if they wanted an upgraded unit, you would move them into an upgraded unit. And we have had that where a tenant was coming up to renewal. She saw what the uh, renovated unit looked like and she said, I want the renovated unit, even paying $300 more. Nice. Yeah, we've also had tenants move between properties. So someone, for instance, at our first property, Cannon Gate, the largest unit we have is mm. two by two. And this tenant wanted a three-bedroom unit. So she moved into one of the newly renovated units at our new properties. Are you getting so. the tenants to, now that you own multiple properties in the area, do you have tenants that say, they like you so much, it's like, where else do you own? Yes. I want to move and, out of here, but I want to move into one of your buildings. Right. And all our on-sites are sharing leads which is also good. Oh. And we're using our maintenance people to their best advantage by taking their strongest strengths and rotating them through the properties so that they're working constantly at their best strength, their best talent. And that way we're better able to turn those units. Economies of scale. Yep. That's awesome. Exactly. Uh, next question. All right. This is one's from Bird. He wants to know how frequently do you guys put out your investors' newsletters? 
every month, like clockwork. If I don't have my newsletter in by the 10th, I'm hearing from Cindy and she's banging on my door. So we have them out to her by the 10th and then she releases them after that in the portal. Next question. This one's from Lisa. She wants to know how many people are on your GP side? On our GP side, we have a tick, which is tenant in common, which was a 1031 exchange. We have the outlaws, which are four people. We have Eric and Vanessa. Then we have Trinity, which are three people on our GP. So you've got the outlaws, you've got Eric, you've got Vanessa. Who are the other two? We have Trinity, Dave Berry, Chris Berry, and Cynthia Hurd. Okay. And then we have our tick. Did you mention our tick? Yeah. 1031 Mm -hmm. exchange. Whose was that? That is Earl Nab, and he has his own entities. The only person I don't know is Earl. But of yeah. all of your group, everybody but the Barrys and Earl have been on this podcast. Doing exactly. Different deals. Yes. Yep. The Outlaws, uh, we had them not too long ago. They were fun. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm going to have the Barrys on. They were just at Insiders. He gave me a special machine to help me with my back. I've had this back problem for years, but he gave me a special <laughs> blood machine, which is working really good. Next question. This one from Edison. He wants to know, was a $300 rent increase? Did people stay or did they leave? We have had progressively more renewals because they're renewing at $150, a $50 rate. Initially, there was a shock and awe problem where we had a lot of people noticing to vacate. But as the time has gone on, we've seen significantly more renewals each time. Part of that is they're looking at the market. They're going out actually to see what is out there and they're finding out that this is still a better rate for them there. One of the things that we realized when we started talking about this property is that the owner had not increased rents for over three years. And so there was a big gap between what they were currently paying with any other property in the market I was charging. In our analysis, we were seeing that they were $500 under market rate. So by raising to $300, we're still under market rate and have room to raise rents. And with the renovations that we're doing on the exterior, on the interiors, we're capable of meeting that. Next question. All right. This is two people ask the same question. This one's from Rico and Bert. They want to know what was the biggest challenge on this deal for you guys? I think like any of them, it's the raise. There's a lot of stress during that time and you're talking to lots of people and you get a lot of commitments and then you get some people who follow through and some people who don't. And That is a stressful time. The rest of it is mechanics. And fortunately, we have just a fantastic team that each has our own strength and how we that we bring to the deals and there's redundancy there. So it's typically the raise. And we have a grid that we put out that has responsibilities. It's everybody's responsibilities outlined and what they are responsible for. And we try to keep it within everybody's strengths. So for instance, my responsibilities were working with the SEC attorney, the real estate attorney, and the title company. And uh, of course, Eric's was working with the lenders. We went with Freddie Mac and he worked that all the way through. He also helped me with the SEC attorneys. And then Vanessa was working on the raise. We were all working on the raise, but she worked on the raise the hardest. And Cindy was doing all of the financials and working with all of the due diligence information. We all helped in the due diligence information and acquiring it, but she was also working with the property management company. And then Lynn and my husband, Laird, who was with us, did all the on-site walkthroughs of each and every one of the units with the property management crew and with a um, contractor. So we all work to our strengths and everybody gets the job done. Excellent. Next question, Jermaine. All right. We got a couple more questions that were just typed in. This one is from Greg. He wants to know how much was your acquisition fee for both deals? Oh, good question. I should ask That's a good question. Good question. <laughs> The acquisition fees were incredible this time. The first time we went through and did Canongate, we got a 3% acquisition fee. On this one, we have two properties. Pecan Ridge is the largest. It has 132 units and Commodore is 100 units. So that brings up 132 units. And we received a 4% acquisition fee on, let me see which one I told Dave which one, but I'm going to go back here real quickly. We've got a 4% acquisition fee on the smaller one, Commodore, and we got a 5% acquisition fee on Pecan Ridge. Wow. So you're looking at about a half a million in acquisition fees. Yeah. 480000 Pretty sweet for putting the deal together. Yeah. You didn't pay it at the closing. That's so great about acquisition fees. You get well, paid for like hard work. But... And we all put it back in because you don't earn anything unless you have skin in the game. That's true too. 
That's a good point. You need to be prepared to put it back in and, and keep it in to, the deal. Did you need to put it back in to help out with the raise or did you decide to put it back in because it was such a good deal? Decided to put it back in because it was such a good deal. And I actually put a little more than that in. Excellent. So. Good. All right. Last question, Jermaine. Is this it? This is the last one. This one is from Julius. He wants to know how long do you guys plan on keeping this property? Five years. Five years. Yep. Five years and out. Excellent. All right. Well, that uh, concludes this edition of Deal Lab. But next week, we will not be having podcasts on Thursday. It is the start of Memorial Day weekend, and I do not believe I'm going to be here. So just keep a heads up. We may have an early one. We may have one on Tuesday. So uh, just keep your eye out for everybody out there in Facebook land. Uh, keep your eye out on your emails as to which day we might do it next week. It's going to be different. But otherwise, we'll be here the Thursday after Memorial Day uh, dissecting another deal. Thanks for joining us. And thanks to you, too. It was a great deal. And that was a great podcast. Thank you. Thank you for Thank the you. opportunity. All right. Take care, everybody. This has been another edition of Multifamily Deal Lab. If watching on YouTube, please be sure to hit the like button, the subscribe button, so you don't miss the next session and review the contact links on this page.